As most of you guys know, Dave Ramsey and I don't exactly agree on everything. I love credit cards, he hates credit cards. I love leveraging debt, he hates leveraging debt. I like subscribing for the YouTube algorithm. All right, he Graham, hates Graham, we get it. Anyways, today we're sitting down with his protege, George Camel, and discussing the secrets behind why Dave Ramsey's methods have been so successful at helping people become millionaires. On average, it takes people 18 to 24 months to get out of all consumer debt. Surprisingly, it's pretty simple. So it's just the introduction to the new philosophy. Exactly. Keep watching because this is one of the best debt arguments that we've ever had in the podcast and you're really going to enjoy it, I promise. But first, we gotta thank our sponsor. Optimizing my workflow is seeming like a never-ending task. I honestly feel like I need software now to start optimizing how I'm optimizing my workflow. But of course, Graham, of course, that was before I started using today's sponsor, Bitrix24. Bitrix24 is an all-in-one platform that can replace multiple software tools and streamline your business. With over 12 million users worldwide, Bitrix24 is currently the most popular CRM and project management tool. And the best part is that it's completely free to use. You can manage your projects, tasks, team communications, and more all in one place with one of their over 35 free tools. From customer relationship management to marketing automation, there is something for you regardless of how big or small your businesses. And my personal favorite, Graham, is the project management calendar, which has been an absolute game changer in managing my daily tasks. It's available in the cloud, on mobile, or for you techies as an open source software that can be installed on your own servers and is fully customizable. Say goodbye to switching between multiple tools or having to pay for multiple subscriptions. So try it for free today using the link down below and take your workflow to the next level for good. Again, the link is down below in the description to get started today. And now with that said, Let's get back to the podcast. Welcome back to the Ice Coffee Hour. I'm George Camel. Great intro. Thank you so <laughs> you much, think? George, for making this happen. I it gave incredible. it my all. Yeah. It was incredible. This is amazing, by the way. We have this full crew right here. Every time we come to the Ramsey headquarters, we are just treated. You it's, guys are VIP. It's so amazing. Nice. We treat it's everyone so like this, but you guys yeah. are extra special. And the iced coffee, too. I it know, is lovely man. here. We really appreciate it. Well, we love having you guys. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, thank you. We didn't you. scare you away the first time. No, apparently not. I loved everything you did with Dave. It was awesome. If, thank you. If anyone hasn't watched all of that, they need to go back. Because it was some episode. of my favorite Dave Graham content yeah. ever. Wow. Yo, I'm glad we could bring you on, because we had an interesting discussion the other night at dinner. I thought you would have had one credit card, like something. You were like, I was, I'm going to get this guy. He's surely like, just like, he's got to tell people not to use them, but he's got to have at least one. Right, was that because the we're, idea? we were paying for dinner, and I thought, okay, you could get like 2 to 5% cash back. <laughs> it was here. when we were paying like, for dinner. Right. Graham was like looking through his wallet. He's like, yeah. oh, you got any credit cards in here? And no, surprisingly, you did not. So you reflect the, the yeah. mantra of the company, which is really interesting. I live out all the principles, and it's not like a... What if Dave checks my wallet? No, there's none of that. There's no, we're not doing credit checks here. No one checks your wallet when you apply. It's just kind of the honor system that if you work here, you actually believe in this stuff. And so I, I just celebrated today 10 years. We did a fun staff meeting announcement, and I got a little box of my little coins for one year, five year, 10 year. And part of that annou announcement and celebration was like, this guy has faithfully walked out the principles for a decade. And what does that mean? Ten, you celebrate ten years, like ten years debt free. 10 That's years as a Ramsey team or? member. Really? Yeah. So I've been years? on Dave's team. I started as a temp and an intern. Worked in marketing, social media, email marketing. I never, I didn't have any kind of on camera role until 2017. I had no idea because I think I found you maybe two years ago when I started seeing you appear on the Ramsey Show, but I had no idea you were here for that long. Yeah, I feel like I grew up here. I mean, it's crazy. I know you've been, you know. When you start your career young, it just feels like you kind of mature. Like when you get married it young. Definitely for yeah. you. You grow mature. up with your spouse. Yeah. And so I feel sure. like this place raised me in a sense. I met my wife here. She still works here. Really? So this place like runs through my veins. And so I'm very passionate <laughs> yeah. about it. And I love the principles and I love getting to help people. It's funny, even the lady at the front desk, she said she just celebrated eighteen years at the company. Wow. So it seems like when people start working here, they just stay here. I mean, once you find a good thing, I mean right. why why go anywhere? Yeah. You know? So, so that was what, my story. So what drew you to Ramsey? Did you start off with debt? Like, what was your story behind that? So when I started at Ramsey as a temp and intern, I was $36,000 in student loan debt. I had $4,000 in credit card debt. And I'd heard about Financial Peace University. I'd moved from Boston, uh, Massachusetts to Mobile, Alabama. And of course, Dave has a heavier presence in the South, you know, in the Bible Belt, evangelical churches and all that. And so I had heard about FPU, but I didn't really know much more than like, oh, he's a finance guy. So what drew me actually was a personality we had at the time. And I wanted to kind of work with him and help him with social media stuff. I was a marketing guy. I was a musician. And so I just loved helping other people 
reach folks in a creative way. And that to me was what marketing is. And so that's kind of how I got my start here was really through the personality. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to go through Financial Peace University as a new team member. Mm -hmm. And it changed everything. Like my whole paradigm changed. And I realized everything I know about money was wrong. Like I was lied to. Like the system is designed to keep you broke. What do you spend the money on? On what? You said you were four thousand dollars in credit cards. Oh like, yeah. What oh was, my gosh. What was that about? I, so I was a musician, and so okay. it was a lot of just gear and camera gear. I love video editing. I was going to sure. go to film school. So you know, you're like, I got to have a DSLR because, like, what if I want to start a YouTube channel? And I need, the amp is a little old. Let's upgrade the amp. And so it was just stupid stuff and gear. And again. I opened a Discover card because it had like rotating 5% cash back. And I was like, that's a, that's a no yeah, brainer, that's right? A deal right there. Yeah. And they had the American <laughs> no Express, Delta, Sky Miles card. So, like, well, you know, I want to travel and see my family. I can do. Right. And all of a sudden, I'm carrying a balance of $4,000 and I'm broke, going like, but they, they told me this is the path. Like, this is what's going to get me the free stuff and the cash back. And so at some point, I was just like, it's not worth it. And so I cut up the yeah. cards. Now, when you spent that money, though, I assume you just didn't have the cash to pay it off. So what was your plan with that? Just you're going to put it on a card. Did you expect to make enough money to pay off I the guess credit card? So. Or were you I not mean, thinking that far? It's always the plan that you're going to have the money later sure. to pay it all off at the end of the month. Like when the right. bill comes due, I'm going to have the money. But as I now know, taking calls on the Ramsey Show every day, it just doesn't always work out like that. Life hits you. There's an emergency. And most of the people who are using the credit cards, they don't have a pile of cash in the bank to cover those expenses. And that was me. You know, I was 23 years old, just mm. getting started with an entry level salary. Like, I didn't have much. But you had spent some time in college, correct? Yes. And I graduated. You luckily. graduated. What did you study? I studied communication because I wanted to go into marketing and media and film. And that was about as close as I could get. And how'd you get your initial job at the, the Ramsey Solutions? It was actually through some Twitter DMs. I was very persistent, tenacious, you know, much like you guys, a lot of hustle. And I was just like, I want to work there. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll do whatever you want. I'm here to just serve. I want to be there. And what drew you exactly to it? You said it was a personality, but what was it specifically? Um, I think it was, you know, me coming out of, I grew up Arabic Baptist, which is very strange if you know anything about the Middle East and religion. You know, people are like, you weren't Muslim? But growing up in, the, in this Arabic Baptist bubble of Boston, I came from this evangelical background, and I love the way this personality brought kind of faith and humor and heart all together. And it's a lot of what we do here. You know, a lot of mm -hmm. faith, a lot of humor, a lot of heart. Um, and that's, that's Dave in a nutshell mm -hmm. and so entertaining. So that's what really drew me to this place is just kind of seeing someone with a really inspiring message present it in a creative way. So you were a casual viewer turned hardcore fan turned I want to work with this guy. So you DM them a bunch on Twitter and then you made it work. Yeah, and that turned into, well, let me get in touch with another person, and that became, let's get a call with HR, mm -hmm. and it was like, let's try to find a way to make this work, because, you know, they don't, you can't be an intern if you already graduated from college. So it became, how do we get an intern? Well, let's make him a temp. So they found a temp role for me in social media, and so that all st sort of percolated into a full-time role months later. Interesting, and mm -hmm. you were in poor financial standing when you first started working yeah. here. Did they take that into consideration at the time? Do you tell them, like, hey, like, I got student loans, I got 4K of credit card debt? There's not, like, like a money confessional during the interview <laughs> process, but they do uh, ask you to do a budget. Which I know you guys yeah. are, you know, not the biggest budgeters, as I heard from Caleb. Uh, this Hale. guy's Jack. a big budgeter. I am I was a big budgeter, not so much anymore. So, yeah, part of the budget is just to go like, hey, we want to make sure that what you need to make it is enough and that our salary that we can offer you is going to cover that. Because what you don't want is someone to start working here and all of a sudden they're like, I can't even make this work. And with people coming in with a whole bunch of debt, it can be tough. And so it's I think it's a really cool part of the process to just go like – do a budget. And for some people, they may be doing Wait. it for the first time. Now, so they look at the income that they're about to, to pay and say, can you can you live off this income? Essentially. I mean, it's it's that a very is, basic never math heard equation. Of that I actually really like that. That is insane. I like that a lot. And it's not to yeah. like pry into your finances and it's all about your income. It's just going, what are your expenses? And we want to make sure that this makes sense for you financially. This right. would be interesting. There's this clip that's gone viral lately. You probably have seen it of J uh, the CEO, Jamie Dimon, from J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, was speaking with oh. an employee who's making, or or she was talking about someone making sixteen dollars and twenty five cents an hour, uh, going in debt. I think she was in the red four or five hundred dollars a month working this job at J.P. Morgan Chase, and they wanted her to be making more money. And there was this really interesting clip. You should react to this. Um, 
But I think had they done a budget on that, it would have been very apparent right from the very beginning that this is not the right job for her to be able to pay her expenses. Hmm. Well, you guys know this. I mean, a lot of people are out there, they're hurting from inflation <coughs> and the housing market and interest rates and like yeah. life feels impossible. But when I dig into people's finances, generally it's not the egg prices that are actually keeping us broke. It's the debt payments. And I did a man on the street the other day in downtown Nashville and this girl's like, I have to live with my parents. I don't, I'm like, how much do you make? She's like, I make $80,000. I was like, and you can't move out? She's like, no. I was like, well, what's what's happening in your finances? How much debt do you have? What does it add up to a month? She said, I have $2,000 in payments a month on just consumer debt. And so I was like, well, if you didn't have $2,000 in debt, you would have $2,000 more to budget and use to live your life and afford rent. And so it's very clear to me that debt is a huge problem with this generation especially. We'll get on to the debt yeah. debate right at the end. That's a retention hack, everyone. So yeah, stay yeah. till Ooh. the end. Exactly. And you're going to review some of Jack's spending hacks. Yeah, oh, we, I we can't could potentially wait for do this. a little yeah. audit on me. Maybe Graham, too, if he's open to it. But let me four things on that list. Here's what Graham spent in the last month. Exactly. But let's get on to uh, your, your start here at Ramsey. So you started out, what did you say you were doing? Marketing? Yes, I was a social media mm -hmm. marketer, email marketing coordinator. Mm -hmm. So I was in marketing for my first four years here. And FPU is not mandatory to go through as a new employee here, but it is it's suggested or it's it's a it part is, of the culture? It is. It's part if you haven't gone through it, it's part of the onboarding process. So there's a few books that we want you to read. Some of them are books, some of them just books that Dave loves, leadership books. And then part of that is if you haven't gone through Financial Peace University, you've got to go through it. Because this is our flagship money course. This is our principles in a nutshell. And so if you haven't gone through that, you've got to know what we're about. Mm -hmm. And Financial Peace University is just the best way to do that. And it's mm -hmm. nine lessons over nine weeks, and you can go through it locally. I went through it with a local class uh, at a church here, which was really cool. Yeah. How did that change your views on money? Well, I grew up the way a lot of people grew up, thinking like, you know, watching my parents who were immigrants, immigrated from the Middle East, and they just conformed to this American money culture, which was, well, you got to have a, a good car, and, you know, it's probably going to take a loan to do that. You got to have a house, so you got to get a big mortgage, and, you know, you got to get the credit score, so you got to open up the credit cards and get all your lines of credit going. And that is how you make it financially. Mm -hmm. What's funny is no other country lives like this with the obsession of debt, the obsession of the credit score. And so I fell for those same traps growing up. And so what changed for me going through Financial Peace University was, number one, realizing that debt is like a new concept. This has not been around. Our grandma didn't play with debt the way we do in today's society. And so realizing debt is not my friend, uh, the system is designed to keep you broke, and even better, there's a way to rise above it all, and you don't have to live with this kind of stress playing this wild game. Before we go into that, we talk a lot about financial success here on the channel, but what's even more important is the mental aspect and health along the way. And today's sponsor, BetterHelp, is here to help you out with both. BetterHelp isn't a crisis line, nor is it self-help. It's the world's largest therapy service, and it's 100% online. With over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists in their network, they offer help for a wide range of issues. So I've personally been using BetterHelp for the last month now, and I honestly started it to make sure that it was something I was comfortable promoting, but honestly, over the four sessions I've taken, I did not expect how much it would have actually helped my mental health. You can talk to your therapist by text, chat, phone, or video call, and you can even message your therapist at any time or schedule live sessions when it's convenient for you. And plus, if for any reason your therapist isn't the right fit, you can switch to a new therapist at no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality as you would expect from an in-office therapy session, except with the therapist who's custom-picked for you. So if you're interested in getting started with BetterHelp, visit the link down below in the description or go to betterhelp.com slash iced coffee hour to get 10% off your first month of therapy. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode and back to the podcast. Can we talk about the nine steps really quickly? Because I'm, I'm a familiar, I think, with a couple of them, but can you go through them? Yeah, so are you talking about the, the seven baby steps? Uh, you just said there was nine steps. To the Oh, there's nine courses. Oh, in financial okay. yeah, let's, do, let's do the seven baby steps. Yeah. So here's the Ramsey baby steps in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Baby step number one, $1,000 starter emergency fund. So this is just a little buffer between you and life. Mm -hmm. And we found that four in 10 people have $0 in savings. And so this is a huge milestone just to have a thousand bucks in the bank for most Americans. Once you have that thousand bucks, you move on to baby step two and you do these in focused with focus intensity in order. Can I can I raise a point of contention right there because sure. I was on Caleb Hammer's thing where I he does saw like a this financial clip. audit, wow. yes, and he said that Dave claims or he's proud that he hasn't changed his philosophy in like thirty some years or something like that. And he, Caleb said 
if I hadn't changed my philosophy in 30 some years, that's not something I would necessarily be proud of. And this was directly related to that step, a thousand dollar emergency fund, which over time, especially with inflation, has became a lot less value. Now, was it a thousand dollars 30 years ago? For yeah. Sleep at- really? It's always been a thousand. So what? Oh my like gosh, how yeah, long? So that would be about two to three thousand. Yeah. So yeah. how long until that one thousand okay. gets changed to something else? Twenty forty eight. No, I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> I'm wondering. Like, well, here, at, at, here's at the funny point, thing. It's going to be diluted to basically like a lollipop. Yeah, we're know? thinking about this in terms of math, mm-hmm. right? Of like, well, thousand dollars thirty it's years a good ago. Round number. It's three thousand dollars now, but it was never about math. Because truthfully, a thousand bucks even back then with a, a true emergency still wouldn't cover it. And so the idea of baby step one is not to have a mathematical number that covers your emergencies. It's to light a fire under you to actually attack the debt. Because if we said, hey, it's $5,000 for baby step one, most people are going to fall off the wagon. Now, you guys are sharp guys. You would knock that out. For most people that we talk to, that's a big struggle. They need a quick win. And the second thing it does is it actually does cover all of the ankle biter emergencies. Like when you think about a lot of the emergencies in your life, it's not necessarily the HVAC and the $5,000 car repair. It's the 200 bucks you need to pay to the plumber Mm -hmm. or in your case, maybe the locksmith. You know, you need, oh, so you know about that. OK, wow. you know, it's those kinds yeah. of things. And yeah. so a lot of it is mental fear of like, you know, and you guys, you're you're willing to take a lot more risk financially than I am. And so the thousand dollars, the fact that, that scares you, but you're so willing to take risks in other places. Mm-hmm. There's just a mental hurdle to get past where you go, I'm going to get a thousand dollars and I'm going to follow this proven plan because it works. And that's the wild part is it it feels like it's not enough. And yet millions of people do it and they go. Oh, I survived. I made it. Sure. That's actually really interesting. And it's, it's not a long term thing. Because remember, baby step two, when we tell people to get out of debt, on average, it takes people 18 to 24 months to get out of all consumer debt. Huh. And so then you fully fund that emergency fund right. to three to six months of expenses, which is, you know, widely regarded as the right number. Yeah. So it's just the introduction to the new philosophy. Exactly. Okay. Actually, this is not meant to be a long term savings. Okay. Let's it's go on to the just next, a buffer. Yeah. The next couple steps. So this one, I'm sure you'll have contention here too. Oh no. Baby step two. Pay off all consumer debt using the debt snowball method. Okay. What's the snowball method? So the snowball method means we are looking at all the balances and ignoring the interest mm-hmm. rate. I know, Graham. Just yeah. go with me. Okay. Go with me. Defy I'm logic. I'm really trying here. Delete all the right. interest rates out of your head. Look right. at the balances. Pay off. Pay all minimum payments on all of those balances except for the smallest one. And with that smallest one, we are attacking it with a vengeance. Everything you can sell, side jobs, any margin you can create by slashing expenses, we throw onto that smallest debt. And what does that do? Well, it speeds up the process. Mm-hmm. And so that that debt's knocked out. We free up a payment. So now we can apply all the margin we had plus that payment they got freed up towards the next debt. And so you can see the snowball gets more snow as it rolls down the hill. Yep. So it sounds like the baby steps aren't attacking like financial instability from the most advantageous no. angle, but it's more so doing it from like fixing the psychology of financially broken people. Oh yeah, we say all the time that personal finance is 80% behavior. It's only 20% head knowledge. We all know what to do, right? We all know not to go into credit card debt and not to overspend and yeah. to live on less than we make. But it's so hard to do. And so when it comes to getting out of debt, we can't go in the same way to get out. And so it's got to take behavior change and sacrifice. And Graham, I, you, you, uh, you've you said this in one of your past clips where you reacted to that living on less than you made is one of the best financial decisions oh, yeah. you've ever made. Yeah. Dave Ramsey is really a therapist is what, what I've realized. That is a like, hard pill for me to swallow because I'm like, I just feel like you've got to do like the financially smart no. thing if you're just looking at the numbers, but it actually makes, thing is, actually makes a lot of sense. If you're well, there's a lot of emotion. To, I know, you, yeah. you know it's a lot of logic, but there's so much emotion tied up with money that's subconscious that we don't really think mm-hmm. about, talk about. But think about every purchase you've made. There was some emotion tied to it. Some of it was necessity, right? You have to pay the light bill. But some of it is just like, I saw it, I want it, I'm going to get it. Mm-hmm. That's most of our consumer culture yeah. today. I feel like, too, for Dave, if you're speaking to a room of 1,000 people, probably 900 of them yes. have, a, have right. a behavior problem. And maybe 100 people would, would do better with the, with the avalanche method, you know? Which is, let's attack Which the highest interest rate. highest first. interest rate. But for 900 of those people, they'd yes. be better off just starting with the bottom and working their way up. Yeah. That's what I brought up to Dave on the first time. And I'll ask you that question at the end of the episode. Another retention hack. Uh, but let's go on to the third baby step. Okay, so baby step three, once we have all of our debt paid off, mm-hmm. all consumer debt, we have a thousand bucks in the bank saved, 
Now we go back and fully fund that emergency fund with three to six months of expenses. Okay. Not income, but expenses. So bare bones expenses. What would it take if you guys lost all of your income and you had to survive for three to six months? Mm -hmm. And so that part, on average, takes our folks about six months to do. Okay. I like that. So all in on this plan, from having a pile of debt to being debt-free with money in the bank to cover emergencies, we're talking two and a half years, mm-hmm. which for most people sounds like a long it time. Does, yeah. Like if you're 24 years old, you're going, two and a, I'm going to be a grown adult by then. It's 27. But two yeah. and a half years is going to be here whether you like it or not. So the question is, do you want to remain broke because you thought you were a financial genius or do you want to have no payments in the world with a pile of money to cover you? And so it's a freeing thing when you get to that point. Sure. I like that. Yeah. And then what's after that? So then we can start talking about investing. Mm-hmm. And so here's the okay, problem. Okay, yeah. When we talk about baby step two, this is going to grind your gears. We say to pause all investing, including your employer match, when you're getting out of debt. I uh, did not know it was including employer match. Everything. Down to zero. We got to think most likely that employer match is not going to be that big in the big picture compared to paying off debt right now. I mean, yeah, yes, we're, we're talking it's, it's going to be better. You're pausing but, your 3% yeah. match for two years. But when you come back, here's the thing. I found most people are only investing up to the match because it's all they can afford. Yeah. They're broke. So we go, hey, what if two and a half years from now, instead of investing 3%, you can invest 15%. So we 5 x our investment contributions at that point. Yeah. You're going to make up for lost time. The problem is most people stay doing 17 things at once, and 20 years later, they're still doing 17 th- things at once and haven't made the progress they wanted. Yeah, It's probably better to focus on fewer things. Get really good at, like, just i got to do these three things, and that's it. That's the I plan. That. So baby steps one through three, focus intensity one at a time. Baby steps four, five, and six, you actually do at the same time, but they're still in that order. So there's still priority. Four comes before five. But it's a plate that you get spinning, and then you move on to the next one. So baby okay. step four is 15% of your household income into retirement accounts. Have you found that 15 is like the magic number? Why not 20? Because I feel like 15, I think if you say 15% of your income, I think the average retirement is like 45 years, is, is how much it takes you to be able to replace your income. Yeah, we found, you know, there's been different numbers. People, Some people say, like, hey, you, if you're not doing 20% at least right. with inflation and everything going on, like, you're not going to be able to retire. But what we found is the reason 15% is a sweet spot is because it allows you to have some margin to do baby steps five and six, which is college and early mortgage payoff. Mm-hmm. Because if you do 20%, there's not a lot of room left to help your kid go to college debt-free if they choose to do so. Not sure. a lot of room left to pay off the mortgage early, which then frees you up later in life. Sure. Okay. So that's where we go. Hey, 15% into, we say match beats Roth beats traditional. So that's the investing strategy in a nutshell. Uh, No secrets here. You want to get that match first because that's 100% return Mm -hmm, on your investment. Then move on to Roth because we love the tax-free growth for most people. Uh, You know, if you're younger, Roth is going to be a better option for the long term. And then you can move on to traditional. Got it. Okay. So that's five and six. And then the final one? So five would be saving for college, and that one's it. That varies again because some people don't go to college. Mm-hmm. Some people um, might be late for them, but put money away in a, in a five twenty nine plan, for example, sure. because college is getting more expensive. And so, if your kid does choose to go to college, and that's the right path for them, uh, it's hard for a kid at eighteen to have a hundred thousand dollars saved. And so, to have a parent get ahead of that, and we've we've done a whole documentary on this called Borrowed Future that's free on mm-hmm. YouTube. And I hosted a podcast series with the same name, and we dug into this crisis about, like, how did we get here? The entire student loan industry is a giant scam, and they decided they can just raise prices because people are willing to take out debt to pay for it. And so the whole thing got real muddy real quick, and here we are, $1.7 trillion in student loan debt with $45 million. What was the conclusion on that? Why is college so expensive, and why are the costs going up so much? It started with a lot of good intentions from the government to kind of get in bed with the student loan companies and go, we should make this federally backed. Yeah. And all of a sudden it became like, this is a money pumping machine for Sally Mae. And so if they raise the prices, people go, well, OK, we'll just take out more student loan debt. And the government's backing this. Yeah, this is a good idea. And so that became a cycle where the student loan companies are making record profits every year. The students, as, as you guys know, like the wages didn't go up 500 mm-hmm. percent. And so they're leaving still making 40, 50 grand. But now they have two hundred thousand dollars of student loan debt. And what did we tell our kids growing up? Get good grades, get good SAT scores so you can go to the college of your dreams, regardless of what it costs. And so that all of a sudden you have 45 million people fall into this trap of student loan debt, which I think we could all argue 
is not uh, the greatest form of debt as far as ROI. Some people agreed. It's great. They they'll if you're going to be a doctor and you're going to go make three four hundred thousand dollars, there's some pretty clear math you could do to say like there's ROI on this. But going and getting like a, a liberal studies degree and going like, well, I was told a degree is the path. I mean, you guys know that degrees do not equal success. Mm -mm. And as we go further in time, that is more and more true. And so that's a huge part of saving for college. And then baby step six is paying off the mortgage early. Again, there's no parameters on this. We found that people who follow our plan end up paying off their mortgage in about seven years. And the average millionaire from our study pays it off in about 10 years. Hmm. It's tough for me, like a 2.875% 30-year fixed. I remember the last You're time 2. we were- You're 2.875? Yeah. What are you? 2.874. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. What's well, the same thing? I just round up. That's a win. Oh, you that's a win for our boy Jack. Yeah, it's the point like nine nine basically. I just it's rounded oh, okay. up. So we're arguing uh, we're over like thing. an extra two dollars a month. It, it's something like that. Well, mine's the same. I just I round it's the it same? up. Yeah, it's Dang, the same. Yeah, same. I beat you. So man. here's the a question because I know you like, bought your first rental property in cash. I did. Why not take out a mortgage to do that? I tried. Oh, and they yeah, didn't let I you. got denied because I didn't have a credit card. Oh, and that and believe it or not, you didn't have a credit score. This Correct. is an interesting discussion Correct. here. And I, yeah, yeah. So that was one of my biggest regrets. That's what actually really got me into credit cards to begin with. You were like, I well, had, I'm not, not going to fall for this I again. I had no debt. I paid everything with cash, and I saved. So at the time, I think I was 20 years old, give or take. I had like 120 grand saved up in wow. cash. I bought everything with cash. I bought my car cash. I used a debit card on everything. I was so proud. It's like I had no debt, and I've never needed to borrow money for anything was so proud of that. So when I wanted to go and buy a property, I spoke with several mortgage uh, brokers. All of them were like, if you don't have a credit card, you need a, you need a co-signer. I couldn't get a co-signer because my parents did not have a good uh, credit score at the time. Yeah, who wants to co-sign for a 20-year-old's mortgage? I mean, that's scary. Oh, yeah, totally. So I couldn't get any sort of co-signer. My grandma offered, but, so she was, grandma. but she was Canadian. And there was a big issue having a Canadian co-sign on my mortgage as an American. So couldn't do that and so I had to buy the property cash but I went several routes I think one lender offered me it was like an eight or nine percent interest like it was so high it just didn't make sense for me to take so I bought a cash mm. and after that I vowed I'm gonna get a credit score credit card I'm gonna build up my credit score I'm gonna make a huge change here and so now that's why I'm like such an advocate of like hey get a credit card build your credit score you could do it for free it's really easy and now I've got like an 805 credit score Anywhere I want to get money from, I get it at the lowest interest rate. But to have money, like you have enough money that you never need to borrow money, in a sense. In a sense, but it make it makes sense in my tax bracket though, because I could use everything as a deduction. This is like my the income. Kiyosaki, like, well, debt's not taxed; it's the ultimate wealth act. Pr pretty much, but if I'm looking to buy a property, whatever uh, debt I have against that property is just a write off against the rental income. So already it knocks off like forty percent of what I would be paying. So like I say 40% just taking out debt on that. Mm. And, and I, I remember your, your discussion with Dave on this when you showed yeah. him all your properties and you was like, hey, what would you change? And he was like, I mean, I'd pay off all the mortgages. He's like, just yeah. to reduce risk. It's not mathematically in the picture here. But um, yeah, when it comes to the interest rate, and I actually did a no credit score mortgage back in 2019 successfully. So I just want to say that it can be done. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it wasn't that hard, honestly. I was kind of shocked at how easy it was. You know, you just submit a bunch of documents, your tax return, 12 months of rental history, uh, proof of payments like insurance, cell phone bills. And well, they've gotten better about it, I've seen. But this was back in 2010. A lot oh, of those things, yeah. they weren't taking into account cell phone payments, utility bills, things like this. Yeah. And Churchill so. Mortgage, which we've, you know, has been an advertiser with Dave for decades right. now. They are, they're the, like the number one in the industry. And uh, so they walk you through the whole process. And I did a 15 year and we actually ran the numbers on this because a lot of people, I posted a video that went viral on TikTok and yeah. it got so much hate. But people were like, well, yeah, if you want a 49% interest rate, you can try that guy's method. And I was like, I got the same rate that someone with excellent credit would have gotten. So we ran the numbers on this yeah. with some of the mortgage loan officers there. And it turns out if you do a 15 year fixed rate mortgage, which is the only mortgage we recommend at Ramsey, and you do at least 10% down, which we always recommend 10% yeah, down, yeah. then you would have the same exact interest rate as someone with excellent credit. On a what? On a 15 or a On 30? a 15 year 15. with 10% down. You have the same rate. And so that argument was just debunked with actual data from, from the mortgage quotes. But it's an interesting topic because I was, you know, you're kind of worried. Like when you want to be a homeowner and there's one thing in your way and that's the credit score, it's scary. Mm -hmm. But having the data in front of you to go, 
okay, I need 12 months rental history. Most people are going to have that. I pay, I've paid my insurance and cell phone bills on time. I have my tax return. I can get a mortgage. But and it so, could also be just as easy to get like a secured credit card, a $300 limit, you know, put a few charges on the card every month that you would spend anyway. Like put your gas on the card. Like every time you go to the gas station, put it on the card sure. and pay it off in full. If even like immediately afterwards when it posts, pay it off. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to skin yeah. that cat. But I found if you're if you're going through the whole Ramsey plan from start to finish, mm-hmm. when we're like, hey, do a placectomy and cut up the credit card and close the accounts, there is a finality to the breakup that is also very freeing to go like, I don't have to keep up with what's the latest credit. I mean, I love your your videos. Yeah. But like the one, you know, here's the five best credit cards to get in 2023. And here's those. the ones, yeah. that, here's the rotating cash back. And if restaurants this month are 5%, I'm like, but the whole point is we're trying to limit our expenses and be intentional and be on a budget. So getting 5% back on eating out, which is something that's going to cost you way more than yeah. eating at home, it kind of negates the cost. Especially when you go, if you carry a balance, you're now at 24% APR. If you don't balance. pay it off in full. But my thought is that if you're going to a restaurant anyway, you may as well save 5% <laughs> So if you're going to do it Yeah, anyway. which again, like very controversial take yeah. from Dave is... You shouldn't be eating out if you're trying to aggressively pay off consumer debt. Yeah. Like, and as someone who, you know, we're both pretty frugal guys, like, it is unwise to go out and spend 30, 40 bucks on, you know, we went out and it was like, there's a 20% gratuity automatic. Mm-hmm. There's a 15% liquor tax on top of the is tax there? if well, you got a cocktail. Or you just don't drink. Exactly. There's mm-hmm. another life hack. Mm-hmm. And so all of a sudden you go, there's no way this is this is cheaper than eating at home. And so the whole idea of like eating at home and I get people are like, well, your time, you know, I saw the Alex Hormozy clip where he's like, you should never eat at home. You're an idiot. If you eat at home, you should always be eating out. Like your time is worth so much more. I'm like, for most people, their time isn't worth that oh, much yeah. more. Like he's talking to the he's making millions 1%. of dollars. Yeah, yeah. Right. Most people watching this, they're making $14 an hour going, yeah. Hormozy told me I should never eat at home. I'm losing money. Yeah. And so there's a lot of debate in that circle as well. But on the credit card side, I just don't miss it. I mean, I legitimately, you've seen my wallet. Yeah. It's just the Apple wallet, and I have one card What's in your it. wallet right now? I just have Let's my see. one, I have my bank card and my license. That is it. You can see here. I'm not going to show you the card number. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But there's my license and my debit card, and it's you can see it says debit. That's true. Verify. I feel like a magician being like, yeah. is this your card? <laughs> but that's it, and it's been such a freeing life because I used to have you know, multiple cards, which one should I use? What's going to be the best for cash back? And the mental energy I was spending and then going, am I utilizing the rewards to their full potential? And we talked about this the other night, about like, what what is the actual dollar value you can assign? And for people who are making crazy money and they've got the fanciest Amex cards, like you're utilizing all the value because you are super intentional. For most people, they're collecting the airline miles and they're like, I don't know how many miles this is because it's not actual air miles Mm -hmm. if you have forty thousand miles you're like that feels like a lot that'll get you to boise one way if you're lucky from nashville and so a lot of people aren't doing the math on what these rewards are actually costing them and if it's actually worth it yeah i think we added up mine i was guessing about twenty five hundred dollars a year does that include the the annual fees is that taken out of that um because like the amex ones have you know some high high annual fees i believe that's including the annual fees and so i was like could i show graham how to save $2,000 in a year just by budgeting and being super intentional with expenses. I think I could. It'd be a fun experiment if anyone out there is willing to try it. Well, and also you have to think for, for 2500 yeah. bucks if you spent that time that you were studying like all the rotating fees and I everything. I don't study. It, it's, it's just he like, hey, study. he there's, skipped there's that part. There's nothing to study on this. It's just like, well, for most people's cards, yeah. most people's <laughs> reward cards, yeah. it's a different scenario versus what you're doing. And so for most people, and also their income, when you look at the income ratio to the rewards they're getting, it's just not worth it. You know, 2% cash back, let's say that's the number, and you make $50,000. Well, after taxes and after what you can actually put on the card, mm-hmm. most you can spend on that card is what, 20 grand in a year? Depends uh, on the card, yeah. So sure. let's say 2% on 20 grand. Is it worth it for 400 bucks? Well, I mean, to it's play that for game? a free credit card. Like the city double cash is that example. It's just 2% cash back on anything you spend money on. So from my perspective, everything is 2% cheaper. Assuming, But you don't spend money. Off. How does this work? Well, I'm going to spend money on something, right? Sure. So it's like if I could get 2% cash back on everything, then it adds up. 
I've just on seen a free card. Most like obviously the people that we're talking to very different audiences. Sure, I agree. You are talking that. to people yeah. who are looking to maximize their wealth. I'm talking to people who are st- like really struggling. Yeah, like they're hurting. They're not making a lot of money. They're yeah. not making hundred thousand. I would plus. agree. To get from zero to one, I think that makes the most sense. If you're a multi-millionaire, to to two, you're you gonna know, be maybe. okay anyways. If you're a multi-millionaire. But for the people we're talking to, they're teachers. They make forty grand, and they heard from everyone around them that credit cards are the path, that credit score is the mm-hmm. path, and we're just trying to help free them so that they can retire one day. Then it just goes like, what is in my way that could stop me from doing that? Yeah. And the risk of 24% APR is not worth the reward of 2%. So I saw a great reaction. I believe it was you and Ken who did this one. The person who was uh, having a wedding, and they said, here's a life hack. You can put all of your expenses on the credit card, and now we got a free trip, and we got our honeymoon paid for with credit card points. I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking that's fantastic. That's a a great choice because if you're going to – if the budget is, let's say, $20,000, you can open up three to four credit cards, get the sign-up bonus on all of them. That's a free trip, free airfare, free hotel. You know what's more expensive? For. The marriage counseling when you start your your marriage but off it, with sixty thousand dollars in credit okay, card well, debt at twenty four percent. Let's just assume, okay, sixty thousand. I don't know if that was the exact amount that they were spending. You could probably do that on ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Get a totally free honeymoon paid for just by opening up the cards, getting the sign up bonus. Let's say fifteen grand. If you're going to spend fifteen thousand dollars anyway, and you're intentional about it, that's a free trip. That's a free honeymoon. So it's saving you money at the end of the day. Well, I got a free wedding, so I can't talk, but. Most people, when it comes to weddings, they're way overspending. And so if it's your money, if it's mm-hmm. Graham's money from his bank account, yeah. from his debit card, you're going to look at that wedding very differently. You're going, let's actually like get quotes from multiple florists and see like what, you know, and like you may be entering this space soon where yeah. it's like, we got to start planning for this thing. And I'm not trying to spend 80 grand on a wedding to throw a party for other people. And so it changes how you make decisions when you use your own money. And that's honestly the biggest reason I advocate for debit cards over credit cards because it changed mentally, it's different. When it's coming out of your bank instantly, you treat that differently than, well, I'll pay this off at the end of the month in bulk. I think right. we're getting very nuanced here. Grant's yeah. trying to pull up specific examples and numbers and everything, exactly why it's better. And then you're providing the psychology yeah, behind right. it all. Right, so true. I think the, the fundamental difference here is that Graham thinks that if you are someone that's very diligent with their money, you go through your statements and you're intentional about everything, um, and you can remove your emotions from your finances, then yes, it's there's a net positive. And you're saying, probably, right? Probably. Well, most people but, think they're that person is the problem. We all put ourselves in that bucket of like, yes. well, I'm the kind of person, I'll never have a balance right. on my credit card. And we're $987 billion in credit card debt as a nation average credit card debt, six grand a person. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, everyone started that journey going, well, yeah, I'm not going to be that guy. And all of a sudden you're that guy Mm -hmm. at 24% interest and you're calling our show and you're like, I'm $130,000 in credit card debt at 22% interest. Well, I feel like a lot of those are people who spent money they didn't have to begin with. Like if you know, I have five thousand well, dollars in my yes, savings account, but I'm saying, but no, I think a lot of people just put the money in the card, expecting like I could make the minimum payment. It's not going to be that bad. I'll think about it for me, you know, a year from now. I, I think very few people see I have five thousand dollars in savings. I'm going to spend two thousand dollars anyway. I'm going to put it on the card and pay it off immediately. I have a feeling a lot of people say I have a thousand dollars in cash. I have a five thousand dollars thing. I'm going to spend money on. Let me just put it on the card and pay it off later. I'll say this. I don't think I would be a net worth millionaire today if I still had my credit cards. I think using a debit card changed my mentality and it changed my goals to where it caused me to spend way more intentionally, be on a budget, and win more when it comes to money and speed up that process. Can you admit, if you have technically on paper somebody who can do every single thing right and play the game, they would be better off financially using credit? They can benefit from it. And that's true. Like, I'm not saying there's people out there who, you know, people who have become millionaires and they don't have debt and they have emergency funds who they can use credit cards and pay them Mm -hmm. off every month and they're going to be fine. I'm not and I'm not mad at anyone who uses credit cards. I'll be friends with you all day long. But the the data is too clear to me and not just the data, but the reality of it, because we take the brunt of people who are struggling that everyone has the mentality that they're not going to be that guy. But then life hits and they become that guy. And so. You know, the credit card awards, I just looked into uh, Capital One's financial statements mm-hmm. for 2022 because another angle on this is who is paying for the rewards. 
And a lot of people are like, well, the interchange fees, you know, when you go oh, and no. you spend money, yeah. it's, you know, 3% is charged to the business and that gets passed on in rewards. I looked at the numbers and Capital One's revenue, 15, over 15 billion came from interest, mm -hmm. which is people who couldn't pay the balance, interest and fees. Only about 6 billion came from the other revenue through interchange, interchange fees. fees. And so about two thirds of the rewards mathematically is paid for by people who are hurting and struggling and paying interest. And so you're not a bad person if you reap the rewards, but for me personally, like it just feels icky to me. Like I don't want to support a system that operates in that way. I think also there's a little level of confirmation bias between you two because just the people you surround yourself by, everyone that calls in, has basically been demolished by credit and oh, everything. Yeah. But Graham and I, on the other hand, like the people that we associate with, a lot of the people we discuss, they've because it's just a part of our, our circle, you know, like yeah. they've done it extremely well and it's benefited them a ton. Mm -hmm. So I think there's also just a difference in, in culture and yeah. the people that Oh, absolutely. Around. Yeah. I mean, you guys are, you're speaking to this percent That's of true. people who are like the f uber finance nerds. That's we are right. talking to like every American, all walks of life. You come to us, we're going to help you. And that's the thing is like our plan works for everyone. It may not be the fastest as far as like, could you go win the lottery tomorrow and could you get really good at playing stocks? You could, but the chances of you getting burnt on that versus winning in the long term is much higher. And so that's where we just go. I'm, I'm not a risk guy. And I want to win as stupid as I am. I still want to win financially. And so I love that this plan works for people across the spectrum. Yeah. Could you walk us through your net worth from when you started here to now? Because you mentioned being a net worth millionaire, but then starting off with debt. Could you walk us through that process? Uh, yeah. And uh, like your net worth by age, if that makes sense? Yeah, I'm trying to think. I didn't like okay. track it methodically. It Exactly. But when I started at Ramsey, I had a negative net worth of, okay. you know, negative 40 grand in the hole between my student loans and my credit cards. And I didn't have much to my name. Um, you know, I had like a little $2,000 401k that I rolled over from when I was at Apple and a few stocks that I ended up selling to get out of debt faster. Oh, really quick. You mentioned that you had 13 shares. Of I had 13 Apple. share. I looked at the splits because I knew you'd ask. Yep. Those 13 shares were worth about seven or eight grand when I sold them. If I had held on to them to today, they would be worth a little over 50 grand. Yep. So no, we you were asking, does that hurt in hindsight? Yeah. I was like, I don't look at hindsight of what could have been. Sure. You know, it's like a relationship. Like, what could have been? <laughs> uh, but honestly, becoming debt-free that much faster, I think it was, a, it was a wash as far as the result. Okay. To get out of debt faster, get the emergency fund faster, begin investing faster, I feel like it was still worth it. I would do it all over again. Okay. But as far as net worth, I was negative forty thousand dollars in the hole back in uh, twenty thirteen when I started, and twenty twenty three. Here we are, and I have a net worth of almost one point one million. How is that comprised? Is that a house investments? Like, what's the breakdown of that? So I am very heavily weighted towards mortgage because we, me and my wife, who again works here, mm -hmm. when we got married, we both started off completely debt free in our marriage. I had already paid off all my debt. We had the emergency fund. We had already both built up savings. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to put down 45% on our uh, modest townhome in Nashville. Wow. And so that allowed us to have a smaller mortgage of 165, which we then aggressively paid over 26 months. And so 26 months later, we were completely debt free. As you know, we live in one of the wealthiest counties in the nation here in, uh, in Williamson County in Tennessee. And so the house appreciation as you know, in the last few years, yeah. skyrocketed. And so that is a huge part of our net worth. So we're weighted about um, at least two-thirds in-house hmm. currently. And then the other third between my wife and I, it's basically just our 401ks. And, you know, we have, we have our cars, which aren't worth that much. Um, but aside from that, you know, you guys, we were talking yeah. at dinner and it was like, you really don't have single stocks? You really don't have any crypto? I was like, <laughs> I'm so boring. I, I literally think, just yeah. have a 401k. Yeah. I have an IRA that was a rollover yeah. that has the same uh, diversified mutual funds as my 401k. And my wife invests the same exact way through her Roth 401k. And we are as boring as it gets when sure. it comes to that. How confident are you with your own personal finances? Confidence. Like, what's your relationship with financial security? Just the feeling of it right oh. now. Oh, I would say on that front, security-wise, I feel better than I've ever felt in my life as far as financial security. And part of that is, you know, just living a debt-free life. It removes that piece of the brain that's going like, you're not okay. 
you're not safe. And I know you guys, that part of your brain was removed long ago. Like you're, oh, you're totally okay. Graham is what? Well, we'll, we'll, well like as far as, yeah. as far as like mortgages and risk and obviously real yeah. estate versus if all of that real estate debt was in crypto, you might be losing sleep. At oh night. yeah. But you're very comfortable with real estate. You're a savant when it comes to real estate. And so you understand what you're invested in. But as far as financial security, I feel great about retirement. And again, I'm not trying to do like the, you know, there's the fire movement mm -hmm. and I'm not trying to retire at 35. That's not a goal for me. Uh, especially as someone who's married, has a family, you know, we just have different goals. And so I'm like, I love what I do. I want to be here for the next 20 years. And so I'm totally okay with my 401k slowly growing in balance over time over the next 20 years versus I need to make a half million dollars in the next five years or else I'm screwed on my plan. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I have a long, longer term horizon, longer term game plan. If the folks that are doing fire, they want to retire in the next five years, you've got to be wildly aggressive. And how secure do you feel financially, Graham? Like, what's your relationship with your own financial um, I feel like I'm, se <laughs> it sounds stupid, probably 75% secure. But a lot of it, I think, like, what the worst case scenario. <gasps> I, th I think to myself, stocks going down 50%. At the same time, there's, like, some sort of lawsuit that happens. At the same time as, like, you know, I don't know. I, I think of, like, if, if uh, like, let's say an earthquake hits... Los Angeles and it's like the one and insurance payouts aren't like enough and it all happens oh. at the same time. So your real I'm estate like, crashes, your investments crash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you still I, have a cash cash position. I do. Which I do. that's a big hedge for you. Right. But I'm like, if everything happens at once, how do I insulate myself from that? Like I have yeah. insurances and stuff like that. We get calls like, like that on the show where people are know. like, Hey, I saw the news and like, should I pull out all my money out of the stock market? Yeah. Like, what if it all goes down to zero? I'm like, if you're saying every company goes bankrupt yes. in America, we're not going to be worried about our investment accounts. Yeah. We're going to be shooting each other for water. You know what I mean? So like that is a, an apocalyptic I am legend scenario yeah. that I just don't entertain. And I have a lot of faith in the American economy that, you know, capitalism and innovation will always cause us to prosper over the long term. Yeah. And so if you, you know, you've looked at the stock market dips in hindsight, it was like, oh, that was a small bump in the road. But when you're in it, it feels like you're being jostled in a roller coaster. Yeah. I'm just really risk adverse when it comes to like, I, I, I like to maintain and conserve wealth than necessarily try to like maximize or build it. So I look at like, what what's the worst possible case scenario that could happen mm. at the same time? And how do I prepare myself for that? That makes sense. So like, that's kind of how I plan everything. It's like, how can I maintain this current lifestyle, assuming everything goes to zero and the market crashes and we get an earthquake in LA and my insurance doesn't cover it at the same time I get hit with something like that's what I plan for as stupid as it is because it makes me sleep at night knowing that like no matter what happens it's okay you're gonna be okay yes the but only I thing that good. that I see with you saying what can I do to maintain or preserve this current lifestyle yeah is the fact that whatever your current lifestyle is is constantly changing it's like back when you were in Santa Monica that was the current lifestyle yeah. you drove the Tesla that was that's how you lived and then you moved to Las Vegas and then you bought this new Vegas house and so you're maintaining that mortgage payment as well as the one There's nothing else I want well then then you bought a Ford GT and then you yeah, bought but, an aquarium and then you bought this and it's like the, yeah, but, the lifestyle yeah. the current lifestyle is it's not it's I mean, obviously, target. it will always be current because that's the only thing that exists. But also, like, it's changing. It's always dynamic. I'd say there's nothing else that I want. The only thing I would like at some point is uh, have a slightly bigger home for a bigger office uh, and more backyard space. That's it. That's reasonable. That's the only thing I could think of. But comparatively um, to the average consumer, you are actually, like, the least flashy as far as, you know, most people with your level of wealth, they are really showy. And most people yeah, who even want to aspire to where you want to mm -hmm. be they're going out every weekend. They're spending at the bars. They're buying yeah. the nicest clothes. Whereas you've decided, I'm I'm going to actually swim upstream against a lot of that. Yeah. And so the things you buy, they're very rare and they're super intentional. Yeah. And you've talked about the Ford GT and like the cars oh, and yeah. the watch. They make money. That, that so Ford you're going, GT is up 30%, Jack. That's impressive. Better than the stock market. Should have Better invested in, in Graham's cars. Yeah, really. Should have bought a Ford GT. Now, that, could, really, be a, that yeah. could be your new business model. You can invest cars. in Graham's purchases. I would. <laughs> and as they That's go a up good value, idea. Yeah, I would buy I them. would love to do that. If I could get a good deal right now on an SLS AMG, that's the car. What's that a I good would. deal on something like that? Uh, 150 and below for a low mileage under 18K SLS AMG, preferably silver. There's a, hey, if you're yeah. out there and you've got that, 
Graham's your guy. You got to do yeah. it. The thing I'm noticing is that you have this peace of mind kind of with regards to finances and this confidence and optimism about you that I really like. And I'm like, okay, that peace of mind seems like it's invaluable. Like I would love to have that financial deep rooted security that you have. Now, of course, Graham is killing it financially and yes. I see him like oh it'd be kind of nice to yeah I'm probably can we just day. say like, I'm probably the poorest rich person that's ever been on your show I mean as far as like most people that are that you guys are talking to they're like insanely successful and so I hope I'm the poster mm -hmm. child for anyone Success. who like works in normal like they work for a company and they have a 401k yeah, sure. that, it's possible for them too without having to like be the biggest creators and entrepreneurs of all time. Yeah, but you're talking like directly tied to the financial success. When I'm ta kind of talking about just like overall fulfillment and like seeming, oh, seeming yeah. like, you know what I mean, confidence with, with regards to We finance. talk about like, financial peace a lot. And mm -hmm. obviously we have a deep faith background in that. Um, and, and Dave talks about this at the, at the end of every show. He mentions this as a part, a big part of what we do. And it's a deep why behind it. And... You know, I just feel more financially peaceful knowing the faith background and reading the Bible and seeing the scripture and how it talks about money. There's over 2,300 scriptures that involve wealth and money, which is shocking to me. What do they say? Well, for example, Proverbs 22, 7 says the borrower is slave to the lender, the rich rule over the poor. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons that I'm just like, yeah, the borrower is slave to the lender. Like, I don't want to be beholden to anyone. Financial, like I don't want to be in chains. But doesn't it depend on the terms necessarily? Because let's say the lender is lending at one percent, <laughs> then it seems like maybe you know maybe the roles are but reversed. But if a if you're, bit. let's say you're, you know, do you have any siblings? The half sister. Okay, so if yes. she loans you a hundred thousand dollars at one percent. Does that not change the relationship when she sees you going on vacation? It, it does, and but, buying a car, and you know. But that's assuming that, uh, you know, but that changes the relationship that's already there because we're going sure. from a sibling relationship to now she she has power over like what I spend money on. But with the bank, you don't have that like sibling relationship to begin with. It's always it's like very a, like, transactional. Right. Exactly. But even then you said, like, what if it all goes down? And so if it all goes down, your best position is to not owe anyone anything in that regard. Right. But I also think that if you put enough money down and you're safe with the property, you fix it up. Let's just say That's I'm talking real estate. That from talking a real estate, estate standpoint, you could always sell it. You could if it's worth much at that point. Correct. And so we all, you know, Dave shared his story last time. And obviously, it was a different time back then, but lender called all the notes. Yeah. Bank got sold, and all of a sudden, he couldn't swing the $2 million, uh, you know, notes that were owed in time, sell, even selling them off fast sure. enough. And so he got burned by that, obviously, and, and since then – has looked at what the Bible has to say about money, and even when it comes to investing. I mean, the, the Bible's chock full. Um, Proverbs 13, 11 says, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. And I'm like, the Bible was coming after the crypto bros before <laughs> it even existed. I mean, you talk about wealth gained hastily will yeah. dwindle. Money that comes in really fast will leave just as fast. Sure. Money that you slowly build up over time ends up staying with you for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. So there's just such wisdom in that. Regardless of if you believe in the Bible or you have a faith background, it's hard to not see the wisdom in that common sense principle. And so it's one of the reasons why I own zero crypto. I just have no interest no. in the anxiety of it and gaining it fast and losing it faster. I'm okay with my 401k slowly building at the rate of the market over 20 years. So. And you think that that wisdom is due to like the long term just like constantly ingraining those philosophies of like you know you work honest work and you just kind of save up a little by little and you're frugal with your money that is more valuable than making a bunch of money over time. yeah well and i think when you work for the money which i mean not that if you research the right single stocks and like you did that is work right but when you like toil like there's like labor involved you show it up and put in the work it feels different than like luck I picked the right stock at the right time, right? Like someone who wins the lottery, for example, there's a recent lottery winners, their life implodes generally, and they end up losing all that money, their family comes after them, versus someone who earned that money through a business, for example, yes. over time. Customers gave them you know, certificates of appreciation with president's faces on it saying, thank you for providing the service. That's what YouTube does when you put out great content and people watch that content. Mm -hmm. When I just chose the winning lottery ticket, I know internally I didn't deserve that. And so it changes the way you view that money and view that wealth. And oftentimes you're tempted to go spend it all. Yeah. I've rarely seen lottery winners where like I took all the money and I just invested it in an S&P 500 index fund and I haven't touched it. 
Instead, it's this changes everything. Yeah. The greed sets in. Yeah. It doesn't and we've like seen that in the crypto world. There's right. so much greed in that world. And I'm not saying everyone who does crypto is evil or anything like that. But we've seen a lot of scammers and frauds and grifters mm -hmm. enter that space. And it's it's a, it can be a get-rich-quick kind of mentality where they're going, if I just get in the right meme coin, well, three weeks from now or a year from now, that could turn into this much. Mm -hmm. And so that is just too much anxiety and too much responsibility for me to handle versus going, I'm just going to earn my pay every day over time and i plan on working until i can't work anymore because i think we were created to work we were created to contribute and that's a you know with the anti-work movement that's yeah. a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow now what i didn't say was work for a toxic company for 30 years doing something you hate that's what they hear in their mind when yeah. we say working is good you know like i want you to work in such a way that you can do the things you want to do and find that balance and you guys have done that you're in the content creator space you own your schedules and time more than most people do mm -hmm. And so you're doing something you love, hopefully. I mean, Jack seems like he's having right, a good time. Right, Jack? Yeah, I absolutely love it. This, yeah, we're I mean, here in Nashville, this is a dream. Man, look exactly. at us here. I'm doing something I love. It's yeah. incredible that I get to just show up and do this and help people every day and spread the word. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, all of these discussions, it, get, it can get esoteric and philosophical and all of these things. But I've just found my way didn't work. Culture's way didn't work. And so I went in a whole other direction and followed someone else's proven plan that was based on biblical principles, and it worked. And so that's there's no argument. It's just like that. It's my story, and I think it works for anyone who wants a piece of that. It is available to them. I agree. I think you should review some of Jack's spending. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know, like, the spending oh. per se. Well, how do you know what but, you spend if you're not doing a budget? Because, okay, because I was born with the— I have— I, I don't like expensive things. I don't like expensive taste. I love, I just naturally find the cheapest things just fun. Are you more of an experienced person? Because yes. that could come down yes. to that. Like stuff. A thousand percent. Oh, you yes. want, you'll go on expensive vacation, but you're unwilling to spend that same amount on some nice clothes, for example. That is exactly the case. Got it. Yes. It's funny, Jack brought this up the other day, and it's true. He is more frugal than I am right now. Wow. Well, yeah. Why is that? that? Well, I mean, if we're talking about like actual dollar to dollar ratios, yes, I am more frugal yeah. than Graham, but that's also because he has like a hundred times more wealth than sure. I do. Sure, the, the so, scales are different. Exactly, but um, yeah, I would say like because you know we booked an Airbnb here, oh, and gosh, like, it took me convincing to get Jack this Airbnb. It was a lot of money, man. Dude, I, I told he <laughs> asked me for Airbnb recommendations. Yeah. I said I don't do it. I don't fall for those fees. I'm not. I can't stomach. The fees, but involved. here's the yeah, thing: like, the, yeah. how much was it? Two grand or something like no. that? No, oh gosh, no. Is it oh, twelve hundred dollars? No, it's twelve fifty. I you guys should have stayed at my is, house. Nice. I could really? have saved you a lot of money. Yeah. Oh, Seriously, my. we could stay at your house. Oh, Absolutely. You tell look, us this now. I didn't I ask you for Airbnb See, I recommendations. Had to spend 625, and for me, six hundred twenty-five dollars is a lot of money, right? And for Graham, six hundred twenty-five. You know, it's uh, I mean, if your dog, if you should have said, you should have told us. Now you will have duties. You'll have to wipe my dog's butts. I don't care. He'll do that. All right. Fair point. I do that for free. Wow, yeah, that's amazing. White Bailey's butt. Hey, next it's time, rare. next time you guys are in yeah. town, you can stay in our guest room. It's it's that's rare, incredible. by the way, for people to to wipe their dog's butt. I have a French bulldog, and so she oh. has an inverted tail. It's a whole situation. Oh. As you guys get more successful, at some point, I'm okay, like enjoying something. You know, I want a nicer hotel. I'm not staying in a Motel Six if I'm on the road. I, I think know? it could be like a financial thing as well as maybe an age thing. Like I don't really have back issues right now, so. For me, it doesn't oh, really to matter be young if I have, again. Like, the comfiest yeah. bed. Or, or like, me and Grammar out here is the old guys going, my yeah. back, I didn't even know what I did, and I tweaked my back. Right, like, here's a good example. I wanted to spend the extra $30 to pick our seats at the front of the plane. And oh. Jack was like, no, we could save the $30 and sit anywhere. And we That's got, like, true. It just doesn't plane matter is, to me. The back of the plane is fine, but, uh, you know. I, I, honestly, yeah, I don't, I don't do plane upgrades. Most upgrades I, f I find are a scam. Like, I they're would, not worth the 30, price. 30 bucks. It really so choose would, a seat versus now. So if you're gonna have choose a middle seat, seat? The front, no, no, like it, <clears throat> back of the plane because we were like three rows from the back, or you could pick the front of the plane, not first class right now. Oh. Like where, what, what airline are you guys frontier. choosing? Graham likes oh, early boarding. Which I don't even guys. Guys. Yeah. He likes early boarding, and and oh, I think yeah. that's weird because I don't want to just sit in the plane for as long as I, I would way rather sit in the uh, in the actual airport than oh. go to the plane early. Because you're standing and waiting. Well, for he gets antsy. Anyway. You know, he's got to. He can't sit still too long. Exactly. Oh, I, I like to so, sit down because then you get work done on the plane. I, I, I don't know. Point is, Different I think strokes. I, I I can't explain it, but th it really just doesn't mean anything for me to 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 look at a price tag of a jacket and think I like this jacket more because I see the price tag is bigger. Mm. I'm sure you guys feel similarly, but it just it the brands any of that stuff I really couldn't care less. 
That I makes sense. You know, I think that's very self-aware. And I've got um, a smart spender framework that I cover in Financial Peace University. And it's real simple. And we cover, you know, how, how to be a wise spender, how to be a smart spender. The S is for self-awareness. Will this add value to my life? You're already saying no. You're cutting it off right there. But going here's the like, thing. This is not going to add a lot of utility to my life. It's not worth the purchase. I appreciate you calling it self-awareness, and I would love to credit it to that, but I genuinely just think some people are born that way. And I think I was born that way. Like this jacket right here, I am 10 out of 10 happy to wear. This I'm jealous. I the need best the I got a coffee free. Some guy sent it to me. Wow. Do you yeah. want one? You oh, have, we'll send you one. I thought yeah. you, you have custom yeah. merch? Actually, We're this would be there. a perfect plug for our website down below in the description. Yes. We bought icedcoffeehour.club. We're working on getting icedcoffeehour.com. Working. Ooh. Yeah. So, so right now you can go to icedcoffeehour.club in the description. We have merch now available. But yes. because I'm so frugal, and I don't want you guys to ship it to me because that costs money. So next no, time no, you no, see no, me, no. send me. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's our gift. But it's true. And that's what, honestly, like I know you said you're not a big budgeter, but budgeting has freed me to spend with intentionality. And so I don't ever see it as restrictive mm -hmm. of like, well, why do I need to track it? Like I'm, I'm going to spend less than I make. I'm going to mm -hmm. have money left over. It's fine. I'm investing. And you guys, again, you're like the 1%. Yes. I find that when I budget for the vacation and I spend that money on the vacation or the car or the clothing, I feel good about it because I did it with intentionality instead of regret or remorse or impulse. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if that might be the ticket for you. I know it's counterintuitive. I just, I agree. I think the intention is nice and everything, but I also think like if you look at it from a, actually like on a sheet of paper like the value of my time if i'm gonna go and like budget everything and like be very like proactive about it and intentional like you mentioned i just don't think that it would really change anything for me like if you assigned a reasonable budget for someone i'm far beneath that so i it, for me spending the extra time on something like that wouldn't really matter and i would argue the same for graham mm. yeah what's your views on budgeting these days i don't anymore uh because my default is always is don't spend money it's always the default um so when i do it's like like your bank transaction list is very light, I imagine. No, it, it wouldn't be necessarily light, but the goal is just always don't spend unless I have to. I would say the biggest splurge at this point is probably food. Um, that would be it. That, but, that's a luxury that's worth it to you. Yeah, yeah, but it's usually at the end of the day, like I'll set goals for myself. I'll say I'll be able to get sushi, like DoorDash sushi which is $70 for like Macy and I. Oh, so for that all hurts of us, my heart. $70, both of us, so $35 each, delivered for sushi at home if I get my whole video planned and filmed. And I'll make that goal. You dangle it. Yes. I dangle it. And then once I do that, You're driven. I'm like, okay, now I deserve that. So, mm. But I don't. If, if I don't finish it, I don't deserve it. That's so interesting. Like I'll have See, little rewards. I think today. which you're you're doing it right, and I'm, a, I'm the same way. Like I don't feel like I should get something until I've kind of earned it. So I've yeah. switched... I deserve it are three words that have caused a lot of people to become broke. Obviously not in this context, mm. but this term, like, well, I deserve it. I work so hard. I'm just going to door dash because I worked a long day at work. I'm going to spend 70 bucks. But I've switched I deserve it to I've earned it. And it feels different in that way because deserve comes up from a place of entitlement. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think earning it is different. So when we were paying off our house, I said, I'm driving an 09 Civic. The bumper's hanging off this thing. Dave's making fun of me. I paid six grand for it from an old team member here. And I said, I'm not upgrading that car until we pay off the mortgage. And it was so freeing to do that because I felt like I had earned it. So we paid off the mortgage. I saved up. I paid cash for the Tesla. Mm -hmm. And so you made the video. Was it you had a Tesla for how many? How much a month? $78. So I'm still planning on doing the video, how I got a Tesla for $0 a month. That's, that's the goal. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. So I like that. And actually. that's the kind of countercultural stuff where it's just like, it's weird in today's world to sure. not have a car payment. It's weird to not use a credit card. And 30 years ago... It was totally weird to use debt for everything we do and do buy now, pay later on a freaking pizza. But now we just live in this culture where it becomes normal. It's marketed to us. And so we just start going, well, now you're the weird one for not doing that, you know? Yeah. But I think there's such value in switching those words from I deserved it to I've earned it and doing it with cash because then there's no there's no rear view mirror going, oh, I got to pay for that thing I did four <clears> months ago. It's so freeing to just be done with that transaction in that moment. I actually completely agree. I've virtually removed the word deserve from my vocabulary at this point, and I've switched it to earn. Because I think not only, like, obviously there are certain things in life that are deserved, like people deserve certain, like, obviously things. But I think the just the mentality alone, kind of similar to what you were preaching earlier, where, yeah. like, it's more so about shifting the underlying psychology than the actual, like, uh, the, the net change. Mm. You know what I mean? You know what's so funny I, I is similarly with the Dave, Dave's line, anytime someone calls into the show, it's better than I deserve. Yeah.
But you guys know what that's about. I Explain. don't. Okay, so this is interesting. A lot of people don't understand the context behind it because it's not always explained. When he says better than I deserve, it is a statement of grace. Like he's actually referring to his faith, not like better than I deserve because I'm a multimillionaire. He's saying like, like, like biblically speaking, like I deserved, yes, yeah. better than I deserve. He's saying biblically speaking, he deserved hell. He deserved the worst mm. because of his sin nature. And instead, he has the grace of Jesus, right? And so that's what he's referring to when he says that. And it's an interesting point when it comes to money, because normally we don't weave that part into it. But like when we talk about doing a budget, we put giving first. We say 10% giving at the top of your budget. If you go to a local church, your local church is a great spot for that. But it changed the way I handle money personally, because I realized like, oh, if I'm a steward of what I what I've been given, right? We'd all say like, oh, I'm so blessed, right? Like, you, you've said that. Like, I'm just really blessed, man. Mm -hmm. To me, what that means is I didn't deserve this. I now have this pile of money that, you know, God has given me to manage. I want to be a good manager of it. And that changes the way I make decisions. I'm like, should I spend frivolously over here or should I invest wisely? And there's the parable of the talents in the Bible where the guy went, hey, I'm going to give you some. I'm going to give you some. And he rewarded the one who turned it into more money versus the one who just, you know, buried it in the dirt in the tin can in the mm -hmm. backyard. So there's so many interesting principles, biblically speaking, that have changed the way that I just view money personally, coming from my background. But it's really interesting even to study it from a financial perspective to go like, if Graham is a steward of what he's been given, right? This amazing net worth, this real estate portfolio, this platform that you've been given, it just changes the way you view it. And I think it makes you less selfish because you start thinking about things that are deeper. Yeah, It's not all about views and clicks. It's about influence and impact and legacy and generational change. And so that when people do other de debt-free scream on the show, they say, I've changed my family tree. Like I had a generational curse from my parents and their parents, and there was abuse and there was trauma and there was addiction and there was debt. And I'm the first one in my family who's going to turn that all around. And that brings tears to my eyes every time we get to do those screams because it reminds me of the real reason. Because we love talking about money. We're all a bunch yeah. of nerds yeah. talking about money. But when you have that level of depth behind it, of kind of this eternal mindset, it just changes the way I make decisions personally now at when I see like I'm a steward of this versus like well, this is George's money and he, and he deserves it so he's going to do what he wants with it. No one tells George what to do. It just makes me more open-handed with money. And that's part of the financial piece that I think you feel when you walk into this place and see all of us. I'm just curious. You mentioned sinning nature. What mm -hmm. does that mean? Well, I mean, there, we talk about you know the fall of man. Like biblically speaking, Adam and Eve, they sinned. That's called the fall of man. And so, you know, we say that God sent Jesus to earth to save us from our sins. And it was a personal thing. It was for Jack. It was for Graham. And so that's what we say when we say sin sinful nature. And it's partially why I always am like, I'm not going to be the guy who wins. Because I have a sinful nature that's selfish, that wants what's best for George. That Does wants everybody have a sinful nature? Everyone. Every human, re regardless of your faith background or where you come from, like, we're all sinners, right? That's why we get frustrated seeing the heartbreaking news of all that's broken in the world, and we're frustrated by it. And while there's a lot of good things and good news out there, it's hard to ignore all of the bad. Mm -hmm. And so it, it changed the way I viewed it when I'm like, we're all sinners, but we have a God with grace who sent his son to come die for us so that we could have eternal salvation. And so I don't see it as like a, I avoided hell, like that's great. Uh, and I know like I can't take my wealth with me. And so I view it differently. Like, what am I doing this all for? Let's say I have $100 million when I die. What's it all for? Well, Proverbs says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Great. That gives me an awesome goal. Uh, the Bible also says, take care of, of the poor and the widows and the orphans. So one, a goal for my wife and I is to pay for someone's adoption or pay for them to get an IVF treatment so that they can adopt. And so there's a lot. It just changes your mindset and your goals when it comes to money when you view it through the lens of, generosity and legacy and faith. And baby step seven, which we didn't cover, which is build wealth and give. And so that give part is important because you guys have heard Dave say, live like no one else so later you can live and give like no one else. Mm -hmm. And he has amazing stories of outrageous generosity and spontaneous generosity. And it's the stuff on TikTok that makes us cry, right? When we watch these videos of someone giving a stranger or a waitress a thousand dollars and they're in tears, there's something just beautiful about giving back. It's the reason Mr. Beast is so successful. We're all inspired by the way he has taken generosity and created amazing content out of it. And so I think it's just important for anyone watching to have a deeper why. 
Like making money is great. Being wise with money is awesome. But without the why behind it, you just get to a point where you hit a wall and you're like, what is this all for me? There's got to be more than just like the next right. spread, the next thing, the next stock. And so that's partially why it's given me such peace is I'm not messing with all that stuff. I'm just going, what's right for my family? What can I do for my community? What can I do to leave an impact and leave a legacy? Um, because on my you know, on my gravestone, it's not going to be like George Camel net worth twenty four million dollars. <laughs> you that know, like be on mine though. <laughs> when, yeah, that Graham for sure is going to have that. <laughs> like I want it to be about more than that. And so that's just changed the way I handle money, and it's made me. It's freed me from going like, well, I really need to get to this net worth. It's, instead, it's like, hey, what's our goal for the next one year when it comes to generosity and spending? Because there's only three things you can do with money: give it, save it, and spend it. Mm-hmm. That's it. I mean, on the simplest terms. And so me and my wife, we just set goals in all of those areas. How do we want to give this year? What are the spending goals we have this year? That might be vacations and upgrading the car or whatever. And they're saving. How do we want to invest for the future? And that has freed me to just not get so in my head about what could be and what's the next thing and what is this person doing? Instead, you just run your own race. And there's such beauty to not caring about what other people think and shutting down the comparison mode where you go like, what's that guy doing? And how's that creator doing? it has just freed me emotionally because I'm a high anxiety person naturally. So my goal is just to reduce all of the anxiety I can in my life. And part of that is living with no debt. Part of that is giving generously because I find that it's hard to have a lot of anxiety when you are giving. And so those are all components that create this weird puzzle um, that is Ramsey Solutions. What would you say are some of the biggest contributors to that philosophy that you've adopted and grew over time? The biggest contributors to that philosophy, obviously it takes someone speaking into your life and taking new information. I mean, so many people have been inspired by Graham and what he's done. I was super inspired by Dave Ramsey, of course, as one of the the goats in this space of not only just giving us financial information, but also giving us hope Mm -hmm. and motivation. Like we underestimate how entertaining Dave is and how motivating he is and how hopeful he is. What's your recommendation for the best bank? Uh, As far as online high yield savings accounts, I found Ally and Marcus to have the best interface, customer service. I haven't been marketed a lot of debt products from them. And so I have no affiliation with them, but I just found them to be the ones that I'm comfortable recommending to people. Yeah. It's interesting. Ally's the number one auto lender. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. They have the, the most auto loans out there. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. But they also have such a great interface and uh, high yield savings account. Well, I heard this, Jack. You were going to take out... <laughs> Caleb was telling you to take out a car loan, even though you don't need to, in order to increase your credit score, so that you have better access to debt. Yeah, right? I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do the uh, the auto loan thing just because it's just another headache at this point. Yeah, uh, and my credit score is already fine. It's like 760. Oh, you're yeah. fine. Um, He's all right, but the yeah. kid's all right. That, that, that's it. But yeah. it is a funny like you have to admit it's kind of an insane game. That, it is that weird. has been created. Yeah, th- like uh, especially if you already have like such a long track record of like making credit card payments and like I have a mortgage and everything, that it would be weird just like, oh, take out even more debt even when it you don't really need but to. But you got to play yeah, the especially. game, I feel like. Of course. Yeah. yeah. But uh, see, I realize like the game is kind of like a rat in a maze and you get to the cheese, which is the 850 credit score mm-hmm. and you realize I'm a rat in a maze. Like I'm still not truly free. You're beholden to this yeah. system. But like, like this is a, such a one percent example. But if you want to get an exotic car loan, they want you to have. Graham, other, why, that is we the have most, five minutes left here today, and this is what you want. The exotic talk about? car loan. We have five I minutes guarantee left. People are curious if they want to get a loan to buy a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. Let's say you have a five hundred thousand dollar a year income. It's going to be very difficult to get a loan on that because they want to see if you have experience handling other types of exotic car loans. So they want you to get like a Nissan GTR or like a sub hundred thousand dollar car loan to be able to show that you're responsible. I agree. A puny because sub one hundred thousand. Here's what you're saying. You're like, this is stupid. Is what I'm hearing at the end of the day. Like it's insane. If you make five hundred well, thousand dollars, I'm just saying. If at one point you want that car, you have to like get your foot in the door. To get a loan like that to work your way up, it's, I think it's stupid, but I also think if that's your goal at some point is to be able to leverage your money and do that, then you have to. That's play, the thing play is the there's game. just such a, it's a, it's, it's a, a different goal thing. Like sure. Dave Ramsey's not like, how can I leverage debt to get the <laughs> next car? He's like, like if you want to buy have, that Lamborghini, you got to me, get a Nissan. <laughs> like the shortest <laughs> path is Dave's way, which is I have cash, I purchase car, end of discussion. And so it's just an easier way to live. It's yeah. a more free way to live. Dave has very nice cars and toys, and he's got his hobbies that he really enjoys. And I just found, like, that's the path that's best for me. And I th- I think it works for everyone, 
it may not be the path people choose, but it's such a great common denominator to go like, no matter where you came from, your background, how smart you are, what degree you have, being debt free and having money in the bank always works. Investing for the future in things with a great track record that aren't as volatile like index funds and mutual funds and real estate, you're going to be okay. Regardless of if you had an inheritance or if your family, if you got the right degree. And so that's just freeing to me because it goes like anyone can do it. And if I can do it, anyone for sure can do it because I'm not special. Like I don't have, I'm not as smart as you guys. I'm not savant. Yes, you and, are. Yeah, I would completely disagree. I appreciate that. Yeah. But it's, it's a fun discussion. And I know like we, we're all friends. And so it's fun to have these discussions knowing like none of us are here to like, I'm going to change Graham's mind no, and no. he's going to become debt free. It's fine. You're no. going to be okay. I'm talking to everyone else out there who thinks they're the next Graham who's going to get themselves into a really big pickle because they thought debt was going to be their friend and it turns out it screwed them over. We only have like a minute left, but do you think it would be more responsible for us to be anti-debt? I don't think it's a responsibility issue. I think you're both responsible, upstanding gentlemen, and you'll have a you'll have a great life and a great retirement. Like I'm truly not worried about you guys. Right, but impact. Do I think you have a freer life? Do I think you'll have a more peaceful life? Yes. And I, like Dave mentioned, I've never met people who paid off all their debt and they're like, man, I really miss having those payments. Like I could have had, th if I had leveraged it, I could have had this much. There is such freedom in just being content mm -hmm. and being okay with where you're at and not needing more. And so I find that it's not a responsibility issue. It's just a freedom issue. Final question. What's your biggest insecurity? Oh my gosh. Biggest insecurity. Uh, I mean, obviously, you're like my looks. Like that's an obvious thing. When you're on camera every day, you're constantly like, "Is really? there is there hair out of place?" Like, you know, I, I'm very you pale. You do get a haircut every other week. We spoke yeah. about right. We did I, every two weeks. I get my haircut. Uh, so I mean, obviously, like looks are as far as insecurities. You know, I've never been the smartest in the room or the most well spoken, and so there's always insecurities when you're around amazing communicators like we have here at Ramsey. So I always kind of feel like the, the dumbest guy in the room. So what I do to overcome that is I just pre prepare more than them. I Google more than them. I do more research. I have to work harder at it. But I'm not a, a super insecure person. I'm definitely an overthinker. But uh, insecurity, I wouldn't say, is, is my uh, token. Do you have any insecurities? Uh, maybe now I do. I was like, oh, I don't think I'm very insecure. And then you're like, I'm not the best, you know, or the, the, the most well-spoken. But again, I'm like, like, well, he's better, more... Better, more well to overcome than insecurity. I, Great job, Jeff. I think yeah, self awareness helps that overcome now. that. Self awareness will help you overcome insecurity. And self what? Self awareness. Oh, just okay. having the self awareness to go like, I'm not the smartest guy. So what can I do about it? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go research and get prepared. And so that's freed me in, in a lot of ways. But honestly, I I mean I had more confidence than I did ten years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think growth, maturity, marriage will do that. That's a fun fact. I mean, marriage brings out all the flaws in a person and helps make you better. And so. There, for insecurities, you can ask my wife. She'll she'll be way more honest. With she'll you. list them off. <laughs> Come on in, Whitney. No, she she was not standing outside the door. Thank you. But I think we're are yeah. we done? We're good on time. We're good. We're good. Cool. cool. Thank you, George. Thank this you. was really absolutely it. incredible. Shout out to everybody in the crew over here. Amazing Thank you all crew. very much. Thank you guys. Thank and, you guys uh, for coming by. It's I, I truly like. It is such an honor to be on the Ice Coffee Hour and to be hanging out with you guys. You're doing incredible work helping so many people, educating Thank people, you. and helping them avoid some of the awful traps that are out there. It is an honor to have you on. Really appreciate it. Hey, cheers. Cool. Cheers. To Thanks free so iced much. coffee from Ramsey. Yeah, there, there we go. go. Someone paid Thanks, for it. Thanks, guys, for watching.